In this course, we'll tell you a bit about the field of genomics, how the field developed, what are some of the applications of genomics, what are some of the tools and methods used in the field, and why it is an important field. The goal of this course is to present some of the basic principles and concepts of genomics so that you have a working understanding of the genome and how and why it is studied. First of all, let's address this question. What is genomics? In the most basic sense, genomics is the study of the genomes of organisms. To clear that up slightly, genome means all of the genes. Unlike the field of genetics, which focuses on individual genes in isolation, genomics examines all of the genes together, their interactions and effects. Before we dive deeper into the idea of genomics, let's do a quick review of some bi basic biology concepts. Once we've covered some introductory material, we'll revisit this question and give a more satisfying answer of what the genome is. As you may know, humans and other organisms are comprised of individual cells. These cells communicate, interact, and work together to form tissues, organs, and entire organisms. Let's first take a quick look at the cell. Inside the cell, we have a nucleus. And the nucleus is where all of that cell's DNA is contained. In short, the nucleus is within a membrane that forms a separate enclosed environment within the cells. When we get a bunch of cells together, we get what we call tissue. And these are usually similar cells doing a similar process. And then when we get a lot of tissue together, we can form what are called organs. And here's my attempt at lungs. And then once we get a bunch of organs together, then we can have an entire organism. Now let's talk a little bit about DNA. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA has a double helix structure. It's made up of two strands that are bound to one another to form this structure. And it looks something like this. There are four varieties. Each of the two strands is actually a chain of individual components that we call nucleic acids. There are four varieties of nucleic acids, and they're sometimes also called base pairs. We've got adenine, which always binds with thiamine, and then we've also got cytosine. And cytosine only binds with guanine. So now if we look back at our double helix structure, and maybe we've got some cytosines in here. And we know that on or sorry, those were guanines. And we know that on the other side of the site or of the guanine, we have to have a cytosine, because those are the base pairs. Right, and now if we have some adenines, also, what does that tell us? What's going to be on the other side? Well, we know it's got to be a thymine. And again, we call these the base pairs. And the base pairs are really nucleic acids. Whoops. So if we know which base is on one strand of DNA, we can predict the associated base on the other strand. And as a result, if we determine the sequence of bases on one strand, we know the sequence of the other strand, and we can say that we know the sequence of DNA at this location of the genome. Now let's return to our original question. What is genomics? 
Well, as I said, genomics is the study of genomes. In order to study an organism's genome, we must determine the DNA sequence for that organism. So first, we have to get DNA from a cell. Except for a few mutations or errors, the DNA in almost all the cells of an organism have the same sequence. There are some exceptions, but we're not going to get into that in this video. Once we determine the DNA sequence, we can compare the sequence from one organism to the sequence of another. So, after we get the DNA, we sequence it. And maybe we determine the sequence to be A, T, T, C, G, C. And, and now we can actually compare that sequence to another sequence. So maybe we're comparing the sequence of two humans. And maybe the other human sequence goes like this. And if you look closely, there's clearly a mutation in one of these genomes because they don't match up at this spot. So that's what we call a mutation. By comparing different sequences, we can identify differences like this one. And then we can try to determine what the functional consequence of those differences are. So maybe this mutation uh, has to do with hair color. So maybe these people have different hair color. Or maybe it's eye color. Or maybe it could be uh, how susceptible they are to gain a disease. Changing a single nucleotide, which is one of these base pairs in the right region, could result in an altered protein that has a drastically different function, like any of these. When I put it like that, it sounds simple enough. So why do we need an entire field of biological science dedicated to studying genomics? To answer that question, let's consider a more basic one. What is the genome? Every organism has one, but what exactly is it? The genome includes all of a living organism's genetic information, its DNA, as well as the molecules that help and store it, help store it and give it its shape. As you might expect, it takes a lot of information. In fact, humans have roughly three billion base pairs. And that number is actually times two, and we're going to explain that in just a minute. Another species genome could contain either more or less than that, depending on the organism. In humans, these three billion base pairs are organized into 23 chromosomes. And we actually have 23 pairs of chromosomes. One set from each parent. And so this is why we have that 3 billion times 2. Because half we get from our mother and half from our father. And they each have half from each of their parents. And this results in what we call diploid. Humans are diploid. So if we look closely at the nucleus of a cell, we might see these 23 chromosomes, these 23 pairs. Twenty-three, and again this is inside the nucleus of a cell, that's where the DNA is housed. Now let's take a closer look at one of these chromosomes. If we look really closely, we can identify genes. And it turns out that there are between 500 and 4,000 genes per chromosome. So when we look a little bit closer at a chromosome, we're going to see a gene. So maybe there's a gene right here. And if we zoom in on that, here's what we get. The genes alternate with spaces on the chromosome. So there are spaces between genes. And these are what we call non-protein coding regions of the genome. And it turns out that the genome is actually 98% non-coding. So only 2% of the 
of the genome is actually used to build proteins. Humans are thought to have between 20,000 and 25,000 genes, and as we said, the chromosomes range from 500 to 4,000 in length. Let's talk a little bit more about genes, and we're also going to talk about something called expression. Expression of genes. Genes themselves are comprised of several different parts. So let's look a little bit more closely at the structure of genes. At the beginning of the gene, we have something called the promoter, which is involved in expression of the gene, which we're going to talk about in a minute. The rest of the gene is primarily comprised of things we call exons, and these other things that we call introns. And these alternate in the gene. And these introns are non-coding. And as we'll find out, they get spliced out. Meanwhile, the exons are coding. And ultimately, they're going to get translated into protein. But before that can happen, they have to be transcribed. So we have transcription. And the DNA gets transcribed into RNA. And RNA is very similar to DNA, but it's, ri it's called ribonucleic acid. And unlike DNA, it's just a single strand. The RNA also travels outside of the cell. So inside the cell is where transcription transcription takes place. And all of these exons get transcribed into RNA. So these introns, as we said, they get spliced out during transcription. But the exons don't. They do get transcribed into RNA. And as a result, we get this string of base pairs that's identical to that of the DNA, except that it lacks the intron regions. So maybe this is what our sequence of, of DNA looks like. And then, or sorry, our sequence of RNA. And we've got our, our base pairs, as we talked about before. Except this time, there's nothing on the other side. There's nothing over here, because it's, it's just single-stranded. All right, we'll get our fourth base in here. When a gene is expressed, the DNA, it will, the, the, the expression is this process, but there's also another process that goes on during expression. And that process is called translation. So this RNA, this RNA right here, is like a recipe for building proteins. And as we said, it, it can travel outside of the nucleus of a cell. And when it does that, it travels uh, to the cell's ribosome, which is like a factory for building proteins. And the ribosome translates the DNA into protein by reading the sequence. Now, every group of three nucleotides is what we call a codon. And that codon gets translated into an amino acid, which are the building blocks of proteins. And based on the amino acid, the protein gets a different structure. So depending on the order, it'll fold differently. And that's very important for the function of that protein. So maybe this is what the first three or the first four codons tell the ribosome to make. They say, you know, this first codon means add that amino acid. And this other codon right here codes for this amino acid and so on and so forth, until we get the string of amino acids. And when we get the entire string, now we have a protein. The resulting proteins that are produced do most of the work in cells. Now, as I briefly mentioned earlier, expression of a gene involves this entire process. And specifically, it's how much 
the process happens. So if a gene is highly expressed, this entire process happens a lot. The general idea is to describe how active a gene is. So a gene is that expressed at low levels will have lower concentrations of RNA and or protein. Expression levels are dynamic and depend on several factors including tissue type, timing, and environment.